Uh, if you haven't already read this, this is just me going piece by piece through the syllabus. Uh, the important part and probably the part you care about most, all of the grade is from homework and project work. So I remember going through my undergrad and my grad degree and them just being like, hey, we're gonna make 80% of your grade two tests and hope you study hard enough. And all it did was induce anxiety in me and I would study really hard on things that I probably wouldn't use in five years. So rather than do that, I'm just gonna have you guys do a consistent amount of good work. Uh, there's a sign-in sheet going around, so if you could sign in. Um, I don't know who she is, but yeah. Uh, rather than have you guys study your butts off and lose your mind for two random weeks out of the semester, I'm just going to give you a decent amount of work consistently so that, you know, we don't all have to be anxious all the time. Um, who here, I'm going to go one subject at a time, who is just now starting or hasn't taken thermodynamics? Okay and fluids. Okay, most of the class. And then heat transfer also. Okay. All right, so I'm just gonna say this up front. These are typically prerequisites for a propulsion class. You have to have already had them done to be able to study. But here's the cool thing is we're covering so much crap in three months that we kind of have to make some egregious assumptions and, and bring things back a little bit to be able to make them digestible. So it's not a huge deal if you haven't taken these classes before. Um, it's just, you do need to stop me in the middle of lecture if I'm showing you something, I'm just like, oh, this is Mac Adams heat transfer. And you're just like, I have no clue what that is. Then we need to pause and talk about it because if you don't do that, what I'm gonna be doing is talking back or talking past from what I just saw, 70% of the class, and that's no good for anybody. So seriously, uh, stop me at any point. These lectures are two hours long, and I would really, really prefer it just be more back and forth instead of me talking at you. I'm just talking at you right now because we're going through the syllabus. Um, but yeah, anytime you have questions and it's just like, I've never seen this before, it's probably not just you. It's probably a lot of people. It's um, a weird balancing act bringing propulsion sciences down to um, an undergraduate level. And so it's, it's going to be happening frequently. No problem, no pressure at all just to stop me and say, hey, let's visit that and talk about that. I have an optional textbook for this class. I think it's like 60 or 70 bucks. I don't know if anybody's passionate enough about propulsion and, and thinks themselves, I really do wanna work in this. If you do wanna work in propulsion and on engines, I would recommend the textbook. I took classes with three of the four people there. The, the fourth name actually is in private industry. He's not at Purdue. But three of those uh, gentlemen, they're super knowledgeable. The guy, uh, Mr. Poorpoint or Dr. Poorpoint, it's like, hey guys, I'm sorry, the next two lectures are just gonna be virtual. I have to go to SpaceX. It's like, okay, cool. So those guys are really sharp and they wrote a good book that's kind of a treatise on specifically rocket propulsion, not as much air breathing propulsion, which we'll talk about the distinction between those two shortly. But uh, if you want the textbook, there's the info and it'll be on the syllabus that you can see on Blackboard. Let me also address that now. If anybody is having Blackboard issues or having issues getting the content that I'm referencing, maybe in like my announcements or my emails, uh, I was saying this earlier, we're just gonna have to deal with a bunch of annoying growing pains. I'm going to have to, this is my first time teaching here at OC, so I'm learning how to use Blackboard at the same time as I'm discovering technical issues with the tool. Like I was saying earlier, I'm uploading the virtual lectures to Blackboard and I just found out after two virtual lectures, I'm capped out on space. It won't let me upload anything else. And I'm having viewership permission issues where people can't see content that it says, yes, they should be able to see. <coughs> so I'm uh, gonna speak to Professor Plumley about those issues and try to rectify them this week. Uh, the good news is, regardless of the, the technical loopholes we have to go through, 
you will have access to the materials one way or another. Even if I have to drop it all on Google Drive and then just share it to you explicitly by email, as annoying as that would be, uh, I would just say keep an eye on your emails for a week while I tell you, hey, Blackboard is supposed to be doing this, it's not, and you're supposed to have access to these tools and these lectures. Here they are for the time being. So when things like that come up, I'll just email you. Uh, yeah, moving on. Uh, to start the semester, I'm just going to talk about, and it, today, lecture one, I'm going to talk about uh, the history of propulsion sciences, as well as kind of what we care about in each of the different genres of propulsion, as I'll call them. Uh, there's, you know, you don't ride a rocket engine on your plane when you drive, or when you ride a plane to LA or you get on an airplane, it's not a rocket engine. It's an air breathing engine. It's a subsonic air breathing engine. It's a turbofan engine. There's a whole bunch of different subsects of propulsion that have to deal with different limitations, different issues, care about different things. And so lecture one, I'm just gonna talk about um, modern systems and what the engineers care about when they're designing these systems. Every other lecture is a virtual lecture. So lectures two and four, you see they're uh, headed with MATLAB. Uh, every other lecture, the virtual lectures, are going to be in MATLAB. And if you are somebody who tends to do all their work by hand, um, that's going to be the hardest part of this whole class, without a doubt, is you will have to have MATLAB on a computer, and you are going to have to code your homework for all of the assignments. That's the bad news. Uh, the good news is all my virtual lectures, I'm basically doing the homework for you and you just have to tweak a thing here or there. So like maybe I will, uh, this is a, a dumb example, but I'll solve the strain on uh, a link that's holding up a bridge in one spot and then the homework will be solve this for 10 different spots. It's like, well, he just did that in a virtual lecture. All I have to do is put it into a loop, execute it this way. So I do the majority of the work for you. Uh, you just kind of have to tweak a thing here or there and then it works with the homework. Um, yeah, but if you do things strictly by hand, I'm just gonna break that habit now for your sake. Uh, and I don't, I don't wanna get on a soapbox here, but if you, when you get to your first job in engineering, or if, if you know, um, if you already have a job and you move on somewhere, there's so many shops where the first thing you have to do is interface with the computer. It doesn't matter how good you are at doing calc or statics. A computer can do it automatically, instantaneously. So why are we not emphasizing students being really good with computers? It's just a kind of bottom line thing and it's something I'm obviously really passionate about and I feel and I just want to impart that to you guys this semester. So again, instead of making you freak out about tests and making 80% of your grade come from two exams, I'm just going to say you need to prove that you're trying to code and you're working really hard at coding over the course of three months and then uh, you'll get decent grades. That's how it should work out. So yeah, um, lecture three. We'll get into orbital mechanics, what orbit is, and um, the atmosphere of the Earth, and thermochemistry. Thermochemistry, you guys might have already talked about. It's pretty simple, like what happens when you put two moles of hydrogen next to one mole of oxygen and then combust it? What are the products? How much energy is released? Things like that. Uh, obviously, that's really important for propulsion because we're blowing stuff up. We're putting fuel next to oxidizer and blowing it up to generate energy. Isentropic flow, that is a fluid mechanics thing, and we'll, we'll talk about that when we get there. Then after the first two lectures, we get into the fun stuff. We get to actually start talking about engines, and we start with subsonic or low supersonic air breathing engines, and these are uh, turbo shaft engines. And what that means is, I, I am skipping ahead a little bit here, um, to combust fuel and oxidizer, you need to increase the pressure of both of them so that they're in a state that they'll actually combust. If I took uh, rocket-grade kerosene and I put some oxygen next to it at 
room temperature, it might not combust. I have to elevate the pressures and temperatures that they're at to make them blow up. And an axial, um, a turbo shaft engine or an air breathing engine, it uses a series of fans and blades to actively increase the pressure of incoming air to a point that you can blow it up with fuel. And so we start there at subsonic Mach numbers. Uh, does anybody uh, know what Mach number means? Uh, yeah. yeah, so Mach 2 is what? Two times the speed of sound. Okay, cool. Uh, so throughout the semester, we're gonna start at the lowest Mach numbers and we're gonna go up to the top Mach numbers, ending at hypersonics. Um, so here, just all subsonic or low supersonic because some uh, turbojet and turbofan engines get to subsonic speeds like the F-35. Uh, the F-series fighters all go above Mach 1. Um, so these engines aren't necessarily strictly dealing with subsonic flow. They do deal with supersonic flow as well. But we make our biggest assumptions and our, our nicest assumptions and the assumptions that make the work easy up front. Um, which is kind of hilarious because here in Oklahoma City, in a tinker, all of the, the knowledge is on these four lectures here. And I'm, I'm, here I am like, oh, we're going to make it super simple and super easy to model. And I can hear from here the engineers when they come and look at these lectures like that. It's not at all how an engine actually. Like, you have to make some big assumptions to be able to just model how the engines behave. And we're going to do that here. Um, yeah. Next comes more fun stuff. We get into rocket propulsion, start, starting with solid rocket motors. Uh, if you weren't aware, not all rocket engines deal with liquid fuel. Some of them actually deal with solid fuel. Uh, for example, the space shuttle, uh, those two giant boosters that you see that get shot off in, in the middle of flight are actually solid propellant. It's oxidizer and fuel mixed together with some catalysts to keep it stable at room temperature. And then when you put a match next to it, it all blows up. Um, so we'll start with solid rocket motors because they're a lot easier than liquid rocket engines. That's what comes next. Mm. And that first subject is the most important thing, compressible flow. So here at OC in fluid mechanics, I think I could be wrong. Maybe they've changed the curriculum. But when I went through OC in my undergrad, fluid mechanics was purely incompressible flow. It was all subsonic flow. And here we are dealing with highly supersonic flow. And flow is definitely above Mach 1. And so compressibility effects come into play. That is shock waves begin to form in our flow, which completely changes the behavior of the flow and changes pressure, density, temperature, uh, it kind of just changes how we look at these systems that are operating now at supersonic Mach numbers. So uh, get into, yeah, go ahead. I think that's how our fluid still is. It's just all incompressible? Yeah, that's yeah. like our number one assumption like almost every time. Mm -hmm. Incompressible and then it's steady flow. Well, the cool, thing, like the cool thing is honestly, when you're dealing with purely compressible flow and you do these nice models, it's really simple. I could, I could show you all of the compressible flow equations, at least when they're isentropic, on one slide. It's nothing crazy. Um, so yeah, we get into compressible fluids and we talk about what a nozzle does. So in incompressible flow uh, or subsonic flow, to make flow speed up, you constrict the pipe, right? You reduce the area that the flow is going through and by continuity, you have to increase the velocity so that mass flow is equal at those spots. But with supersonic flow, it actually flips. That's why you see rocket engines shaped the way that they are with the nozzle bell, is you want to expand flow. If you allow flow to do the opposite, instead of constricting it, you expand it, the Mach number increases, which is kind of unintuitive, but that's the way it works out with supersonics. Excuse me. So yeah, uh, the beginning is a lot of fluid mechanics and then uh, lecture 11 is getting into the solid propellant. What happens when I put a fire next to my, um, my solid propellant? How, do, how does it behave? And we get into what's called grain regression modeling. Um, 
It's really kind of nifty. It's uh, it's basically a Roman candle. A Roman candle is the the simplest example of a solid rocket motor, and engineers will um, design the cross section of the solid rocket motor of this tube. They'll they'll design it such that they can control how much thrust it's doing at any given point in time, um, and it gets really complicated really fast. Like. I, I, we'll get into it. I'm excited to talk about that part. Then we get into liquid rocket engines. This is where it gets a bit more complex because we're dealing with um, not just one bulk propellant as with a solid rocket motor. The solid rocket motor is comprised of this much uh, HCPV, this much catalyst, and that's it. Well, with a liquid rocket engine, you can actually vary how much oxidizer you're flowing into the engine and how much fuel you're flowing into the engine. And so it starts to behave a little bit differently. But uh, if you haven't noticed already, I talk about specific engines. Instead of talking about a concept and it's like, why do I care about this? I will talk about the engine that made it break because they didn't know about the concept yet and then they fixed it. So uh, starting there with the Rocket Dean F1, uh, we get into modern propellants, that is propellants that don't suck. Uh, whenever rocketry started, they used things like water, like literally steam and water to propel the rocket and the performance was obviously terrible. So um, we talk about what people like SpaceX, NASA, um, Blue Origin are using now for their rockets. And then uh, the biggest technical hurdle is probably lecture 15. That's when Blake's going to be here. And that's getting into heat transfer. Uh, and if you didn't already know this, this is kind of a fun fact. In rocket engine nozzles, the coolant is actually the fuel. They use the fuel as a coolant. And the temperatures that are seen there are as low as like. 50 Kelvin, so like negative 400 Fahrenheit. And then on the other side of the wall, you have 5,000 Fahrenheit. So as you can imagine, modeling the cooling of a rocket engine is just insane. Um, and you're making assumptions the entire way through. And uh, this is a bit of a left turn, but we can talk propulsion theory all day, but at the end of the day, the engineers out in the field who are actually doing this stuff have to put an engine on a, tan on a stand, or at least a component of an engine on a stand, and then test it to see how it blows up. And they will blow it up multiple times because the models are not perfect. So we can talk about models all day, but when it comes down to the nitty gritty and actually being a propulsion engineer, it's a different ball. And then we talk about the Raptor, and yep, that's lecture 17. I threw this in last minute because hypersonics actually uses a lot of the content that we study in this <coughs> specific lecture. This talks about uh, matter in excited states. So whenever things like your, your air that is flowing through your engine or your fuel are at high enough temperatures, you have different modes of excitation that you never cared about before or didn't exist, such as how ionized your air is. You'll actually end up with oh, like valence electrons flying around and the whole behavior of the fluid completely changes. So we'll study that in electric propulsion, which I didn't know existed until I started my master's. So electric propulsion is really weird and they're used for deep space engines, um, they'll sometimes like impart a tenth of a newton of force, like nothing. And the way they work is by taking a really dense neutral uh, atom of something and then ionizing it, that is to take the electrons out so it has a positive uh, charge and then shooting it through some medium that it expands it and accelerates it. And that just, barely produces enough thrust to keep a satellite in orbit or to send your satellite out to another planet, things like that. Uh, that is electric propulsion, which again, I just say that because I didn't know it existed until I started my master's. <laughs> and then finally, uh, we end everything with hypersonics. 
and uh, the first two lectures are on ramjets and scramjets, which are super nifty. Uh, the engines that you fly on planes, like a, a 747 that you take to go visit your parents or whatever, um, that is that requires compressors and turbines and all of these blades, right, spinning with the air to generate energy and make the engine work. But with ramjets and scramjets, it's literally just compressible fluids and shock waves that will increase the pressure and temperature of the air flowing through the engine to the point that you can combust it. So there's no moving parts in theory. There are some when, again, you're actually building the engine, but uh, there's pretty much nothing moving. It's just a tube flying through the air. And it is uh, a very closely guarded and classified space that I can only talk about from some journals I've studied. But whenever you're talking about ramjet technology and hypersonics and things like that, then I can't tell you what people in the field are really doing because it's, it's just something that's classified. So we cap it all off with, <laughs> ironically, a, a vehicle called Hypersonic Technology Vehicle 2 developed by DARPA and literally just half for fun but also half as a thought experiment we're just going to look into whether or not this aircraft is even feasible um, it flew in theory for five minutes at Mach 20 and I have this inkling of a feeling that that's not possible with a scramjet and you can't uh, actually ignite an engine at those Mach numbers and we'll just look into it at the end of the semester and we'll kind of field all the theory that we've learned up to this point about how to ignite an engine, what pressure the engine has to be operating at, how do you expand the flow, uh, what temperatures are we gonna see on the surface of this vehicle, things like that. All these, these little bits and pieces that we learn over the semester, we're gonna let it culminate in this last fun lecture and uh, take a look at that thing and see if it can even possibly be a scramjet. I'm more uh, convinced it's a detonation engine, and that gets into a whole nother ball field. Uh, all of these engines we talk about go through a chemical process called deflagration. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, where uh, whenever you combust, fuel and oxidizer is happening at lower than the speed of sound. The, that's how fast the uh, reaction actually propagates across the flame front. But with detonation, you, have, you literally have a sustained explosive going through your engine. And uh, we'll end it there on hypersonics. So that was probably way too much information and is a bit vexing to hear. But really, I want to emphasize that the goal of this class is not to make you a propulsion engineer in four months. That's not possible. But let's uh, be realistic. What I want is to be able to say something like the, um, the turbine exhaust from the Rocket Dean F1 was used to film cool the nozzle expansion from the area ratios of 10 to 16, which right now that means nothing to you. But uh, the goal is by the end of the class, if somebody talks about cooling technologies, if somebody talks about specific impulse, you're just able to communicate in general. In propulsion. If you can talk about rocket engines, if you can talk about scramjets, you succeeded. The, the class is good then. The only other thing I would say with that is I'll repeat, you have to, um, you got to get on a computer. Uh, you can't solve things by hand in this class. Just, just not gonna, it's not gonna fly forever. You're gonna get to your job and be like, dang it, I wish I, I just knew how to code just, just one, one percent of what my friends could do. Um, so I'm just gonna, I'll be, I'll be upfront and honest. I, this is the thing I'm going to beat you over the head with. This is the thing that's going to be annoying about this class is that it's got to be in that one. So, um, I already talked about this. Yeah. Once a week in the virtual lectures, I'll be stepping through basically your homework almost. And, uh, we'll use a shared common file structure. Uh, I'm not sure we actually have to worry about that. I worked through all of the homeworks and all the virtual lectures and all that, and I don't think we have a, a super complicated file structure. There's nothing necessary for that, so I just say ignore that. Uh, and then this is something fun. Uh, I had a coworker, Micah, who 
when I had just started coding, I was trying to solve a problem and I Googled and got to a website called Stack Overflow, a lot of you might know about. It's big in the coding world. And some guy basically had the answer for me. It's like, oh, I did that already, I wrote that. And so I copy pasted that code, I put it in my code and then it was up on my monitor and he's walking by, he's like, wow, Ben, that's some sweet code. And I'm like, oh, no, 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 that's not my code. I got it from Stack Exchange. He goes, exactly, that's how coding is done. Every time you can cheat, every time somebody's done it for you, just do it. I know that the way I've written the homework and the way I've written the virtual lectures, all that, there's nobody who has modeled the Mac Adams heat transfer at the throat of the RL10 engine. I know that hasn't been done yet. So there's no like literally one step copy and paste. But if you're like, I can't figure out how to write this while loop and it keeps failing, Google it. Somebody's already written it, steal it. Steal everything you can in computer science. <laughs> I'm so serious. So don't put any pressure on yourself to like, I have to write this right from scratch myself. No, like just, just go to Google, go to chat GPT. I haven't figured that crap out yet. I have friends who have, but it, whatever you got to do to make the code work, um, the way I grade it, you're not going to be able to fool me. Um, you, you couldn't even, you can't cheat in this. So yeah, just go for it. This is one of the tools that I was hoping, I was hoping would be available before lecture today, but Blackboard Complications is just making this annoying. Uh, some really smart people at NASA, I stole their, uh, no, everybody uses this code in, in propulsion. Uh, they wrote a huge library of tools called Chemical Equilibrium, Equilibrium with Applications that, um, somebody translated to MATLAB. So it's gonna be able to, you're gonna import this kind of code into your MATLAB scripts and execute it in your homework and uh, in your final project. It, what it does is you give it parameters like what is my chamber pressure? What pressure am I combusting at? Uh, what is my area ratio? How much am I expanding flow? You give it a couple little inputs and then you press enter and it'll literally tell you I mean, like 40 different species of chemicals that it's spitting out, what velocity they're at, what Mach number they're at, what temperature they're at, what density, what molar mass, everything. It does all the, the other 98% of the work for you. So we're gonna be using this extensively in this class and it's really easy to use. It's another one of those copy paste things. Whenever you import the libraries for CEA, they give you an example for MATLAB like, where did you plug in chamber pressure? Oh, right there, that line. Where did you plug in uh, your propellants? Oh, kerosene, right there. All you do is just tweak a couple lines, press enter, and it does all the work for you. Yeah? So we just go to the software.nasa.gov and request the software, or? Um, do you want to post I, so I have the libraries. Oh. Again, it's one of those things where it should be public to everybody, but for whatever reason, Matt or uh, Blackboard's just not showing it. So I'm gonna have to figure that out. And is MATLAB a common form of coding used for? Uh, it depends on what you're doing. MATLAB is great for mechanical engineering. It's not once you get out into computer science. It's based in a language called Fortran, which just isn't. Nobody uses that anymore. Um, is this really the only class they've got you guys asked? To, has nobody asked you to do MATLAB before? Yeah. That's basically. Yeah. Well, they've asked us to do it, but they haven't taught us it. Yeah. Oh. Procedural programming taught us once. So. Yeah. Awesome. So <laughs> it's. No, 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 I, no. It's good to know because. And that's, this is one of those miscommunication things. I showed up just thinking you guys had already been doing MATLAB in other classes. We've done some MATLAB. We do. I've submitted it to assignments, but... Yeah, the first virtual lecture, I step you through the couple of tricks that you might not have already known about. I go back through the loops, for loops, while loops, if else loops, and that's it. That's really all you have to do with code in this class is that stuff. It's There's nothing really fancy about it. Um, and so, yeah, a print, literally print parentheses, F print F, yeah. yeah.
uh, little annoying things like that, which again, you can just Google. I don't know how to print my result in MATLAB. Enter on Google, and it's like, this is how you do it. This is the code. Um, that's good to know. So we'll revisit that after the first homework and make sure that everybody understands how to use MATLAB and, and nothing was really um, super confusing on the first homework. Because that's really the intention of the first homework is to introduce everybody to MATLAB and CEA and just use it. This is something I ran into all through my masters is a website called Engineering Toolbox. It's not like a, a primary source by any means. It's just a tool I, that me and all my classmates ended up using over and over again and citing in um, our homeworks. So Engineering Toolbox, I don't know if you can read that. I can hardly read that. You've got, yeah, combustion, dynamics, electrical engineering stuff, fluid mechanics, HVAC systems, hydraulics, things that um, you'll run into in this class. Atmosphere models. Um, to, does anybody know how to calculate drag? Force uh, is the force of gravity? Yeah. Something CP one half EA or something? I don't know. Yeah, that was right. times like the surface area times yeah. velocity. Yeah, so one half coefficient drag rho AV squared, but uh, rho density. Oh, it's not. You have to know what the density of air is to be able to know how much drag is going on in your aircraft. So, a uh, good example of something I use engineering toolbox for a bunch was my altitude is thirty thousand feet. What is my air density? This is your air density. Oh, okay, now I can calculate drag. So things, little things like that will come up where engineering toolbox is helpful. And this is a general workflow for the, for the class. Uh, I know every brain works differently. It, it would be wrong of me to say this is how you have to do it, but this is the way I've designed the course, is that you just show up and take notes and just kind of listen to the big picture stuff. And I'm going to post all the slides online, so you have to go back and reference any of them. You can. And in fact, these should be numbered. This is the last time I don't give you numbered slides. Uh, you'll have numbered slides moving forward. Uh, yeah, so just get the big picture stuff in the in-person lectures, and then apply those concepts to your homework and your MATLAB scripts. This is where the bulk of the work comes from, is you actually have to do some coding. And then at the end of the semester, the final project, you'll put it all together. Um, it's gonna be cumulative in nature, and you're going to be not drawing from just one homework assignment that you coded, but all of them to some extent to be able to do your final project. Uh, I don't know why this slide is here. Yeah, virtual lectures. <laughs> yeah, that's something I do throughout all my slides is if I ever show a system pictured or I'm talking about a specific system, I'll give you the name of it. If you think this is the coolest thing you've ever seen, just write down the name and take a look at the other 95% of content about this engine that I'm not covering because I just don't have time to. And that's something I didn't say earlier. I took four semesters of propulsion classes in my master's and they had to skip over stuff over and over again. We didn't have nearly enough time to touch everything. And that was four semesters and that was less content, actually. I didn't take subsonic air breathing propulsion. I'm adding <laughs> more on top of that. So um, if anything is super fascinating and you're thinking to yourself, oh, then I'll probably uh, talk about that a little bit more next lecture. I'm probably not. You should jot down the name and, and just look it up for yourself. I'm not talking about cars, I'm not talking about maritime propulsion, and I am not talking about nuclear propulsion in this class. I'm recording attendance uh, every Monday. If you have some reason that you can't make lecture, if something comes up, I understand uh, club is a thing here, I understand spring sing, excuse me, is a thing here, and I remember in my undergrad Maybe, maybe you're in sports and you've just got a meet or a competition or something, uh, that stuff comes up. Let me know as far in advance as possible. And again, I am recording all the lectures. 
and posting them uh, online and sharing them when necessary. I'm gonna, I still gotta think about how I'm gonna distribute that stuff because I, what I really need to avoid is some situation where one of you guys just never shows up to lecture. And that's my biggest fear, is that you just don't show up. Um, so I gotta think about that, but either way, I'm gonna be recording attendance every week. And yeah, if you need a lecture recording, if you got something that comes up, just shoot me an email and we'll get it over to you. Yeah, uh, this is actually the cool little bonus that you get from taking this class this semester. These are the people I've spoken to so far. Um, and they're gonna be coming random Mondays to talk about their work out at Tinker, their work out at Paycom, their work out at Vance Air Force Base, different places in their different shops. Uh, they're always looking for, you know, folks who are ready to take it the extra mile. So uh, they're gonna come and just give a quick guest lecture somewhere between 15 and 30 minutes is what I told them. And they're just gonna talk about something that obviously I'm not covering in my, my lectures and they think it's important for you to know about aerospace in general. Uh, this propulsion co course is a subset of the new aero electives, right? And so we're trying to get more aero emphasis here at OC. And what better way than to get people out of their shops and talk to me directly about uh, what they're doing out at Tinker Air Force Base. So B-52 in there, the J-85 is an engine. Um, I actually got to tour the J-85 out at Vance and look at the engine and, and ask questions about every little component that was confusing to me. Oh, it's such an old engine. The J-85 I think comes from the 50s and all of the engine controls are hydromechanical. So if I have chamber pressures that are too high. Uh, the way the engine controls itself is it will physically, as a result of the high pressure, push a valve somewhere, a pneumatic, that will reduce the fuel flow to the chamber and reduce um, the amount of combustion happening there. That's a hydromechanical control system. Whereas modern engines, it's all digital and it's all electronic. It's, it has sensors in there that are monitoring it and then there's a computer controlling every little facet of the engine. Uh, this man's boss is coming uh, March 4th, uh, Blake York, he's the chief engineer at the 76 and he works on the B1 and the B52. And then we also have two computer scientists coming, one from Paycom and uh, one from my shop uh, working on sensor networks out of the 38th. And these are all, I mean, if something comes up and they just can't make it, that's out of my hands. I'm asking them to give extra time for free. So uh, that's just kind of a professional thing. They don't, they're not gonna, I'm not gonna kick them for, you know, oh, you promised me three months ago that you would come out on a Monday evening at 6 p.m. You know, I just gotta let them <laughs> live their lives, so. Um, yeah, already said this. Yeah, the, the MATLAB code, I'm not just going to read it like it's an English book and say, that seems right. I'm going to download it and I'm going to run it. So if you're not getting proper values from your code, you need to troubleshoot your code until you do. Um, if if uh, in the homework I ask you for a written statement, use a print statement in your code and then put that written statement in your MATLAB script, which is really annoying, I know. It's gross whenever you have this nice, neat code and then you have a paragraph randomly thrown in the middle. Um, it's not good, but it makes my job a lot easier because it's all in one spot. I don't need to ask you for multiple files. I'll just ask you for one MATLAB file. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, I'm gonna give you, this is no different from any homework you've done up to this point. I have some givens for you. You need to find these things and then run your code. Uh, for the final project though, uh, a lot of this is gonna be code built on code. So maybe um, a great example is a combined cycle system in hypersonics. Um, we talk about liquid rocket engines, we talk about air breathing engines. They're two distinct systems. When you get to hypersonics, they actually overlap, and you'll have 
such as the SR-71 and the engine I had on slide one, it is a combined cycle in that it has both a ramjet and a uh, turbo fan in it, or a turbojet, sorry. And so in, a, in an instance like that, and on your final project, you will have to take the outputs or the answers to the first half of your code and feed them into the second half of your code. So it'll be kind of cumulative in nature that way. I've already harped on this a little bit, and to add fuel to the fire, uh, there was a whole big paper written on this, I think a decade ago, where literally the aerospace industry talked about hypersonic systems as saying, our limitation is computer science. Our limitation is just an environment where we can model all of it in one spot. And it's all down to the computer. It's not, I, I'm telling you guys, I, I joke that you should have studied computer science only because of the absurd amount of opportunity and work that has to happen there. I, I say that half jokingly, I'm a mechanical engineer. I love mechanical engineering. I'm teaching this class. But uh, like, I, I looked in Dallas just for fun on LinkedIn. It's like propulsion engineering, it's like 100 jobs. And I go cybersecurity, it goes 3,500 jobs. It's like, okay, wow, point taken. Um, yeah, the aero leaders that work in hypersonics are saying we need computer scientists. So that's why I'm being really annoying about MATLAB. It's, it's just one of those bottom line things. Uh, I don't really need to touch on this too much. This is something y'all might not have seen since you haven't had thermodynamics yet or fluid mechanics yet. But uh, whenever a system or a fluid goes through a change in pressure or a change in state, maybe it goes through a nozzle, maybe it goes through a compressor, um, we will make assumptions like these saying that the process is isentropic, for example, no entropy is generated to make it a lot easier to solve for the end state of the fluid. If I were to say, take a molecule of air and feed it through a compressor and then ask you for the real pressure of the air at the outlet of that pressure or at the outlet of that compressor, we would have to put it on a test stand and physically measure it. We have to make assumptions somewhere to be able to just model what the pressure is on the outlet. And so these sort of processes that are ideal or constant temperature, volume, pressure, things like that, um, allow us to actually solve for the pressure, the temperature, the density of our fluid at different points in the engine. So this is, this is going to be peppered all throughout uh, the semester here, these kinds of equations. So yeah, now let's get into the actual, let, let's start lecture, really. I, I give you an overview of what we're gonna be doing. Let's get into it. Um, an engine is just designed to convert chemical energy into work. Uh, there's energy that is released whenever you blow up a fuel with an oxidizer, whenever you put oxygen next to fuel or a hydrocarbon, and it blows up. It's not too difficult to blow it up. What's difficult is turning that, that combustion process into useful work to move an object in space. And so um, this is the rocket equation. The change in velocity of our payload or of our vehicle is directly proportional to um, the exhaust velocity. So the stuff that we blow up, we want to spit it out of the nozzle as fast as humanly possible. This is uh, very important, is getting high exhaust velocities. And this is set in stone based on engine performance. So if I build a rocket engine and I put on testing and I press run, and I record the exhaust velocity, it doesn't matter where I use that engine, that exhaust velocity in theory more or less stays constant in space. So it sets the performance of the engine. Uh, this is a ratio of mass for the system. This is the mass in the numerator of the system when it's fully loaded with propellant divided by the mass of the system after we've depleted all of our propellant. So after we burn through all of the, uh, the fuel and oxidizer in our engine, what is the mass? 
and the higher you can get this number to be, the higher your delta V will be. So you want um, as low of a final mass as possible. In, in, a, in a perfect world, really, you would have no wasted mass. You'd have no final mass. All of your mass would be propellant, but we have to keep it in a tank. We have to actually build an engine, right? These things all require mass, and these are called inert masses. And so uh, this is another parameter we have to take a look at whenever we're gauging how effective a system is in pushing satellites into orbit or um, you know, pushing your Boeing 747 to Houston, Texas, because you have to go visit family. So where'd the natural log come from? That's a bit confusing. We'll derive this. And I, I really don't have too many derivations in this class, but this is one that I wanted to focus on. Um, so this is actually the conservation of linear momentum equation, and that is where the natural log came from. We start with the conservation equation, and then we have to rearrange it and do some calc to get delta V alone. And I'll just skip ahead there. So if you want to stare at those equations, write those down, uh, feel free to. I'm not going to quiz you on them. I just want to show you where the natural log came from. Uh, the integral of 1 over x is natural log x. So that's where it came from. And I, I touched on this a little bit earlier, but um, we can model things all day. We can say, oh, I have the equations that will describe how this engine should behave. But um, the slightest, in reality, the slightest crack in a combustion chamber can blow it up. Because if you have a crack, uh, you'll have a local pressure distribution that is not stable. Now you have a spot where the pressure is rising and it happens to be in the weakest part of your engine. And it might blow it up. So we can model things all day. In reality, uh, engines will just fail because of things you didn't see coming. <clears throat> Where did all this work start? Uh, ironically, it actually started with Germany in World War II, which might be a bit unexpected, but the V2 rocket was a weaponized liquid rocket engine that was cast on Britain throughout the war. It might have actually been used elsewhere. I don't know. I'm not a historian, but that was the first staged combustion cycle and this is where, without getting way too deep into it way too early on the first lecture, Germany discovered that if you want to make a big rocket engine work, just light a little mini rocket engine off to the side and then use that to power the big engine. And that is staged combustion, and Germany did it first. So the V2 rocket was really the first step in liquid rocket propulsion um, for the world. And we took a lot of those scientists after the end of World War II in Operation Paperclip and brought them over to the United States to help us in a space race against the Soviet Union. And that rocket is based on V2 technology. And that rocket uh, brought our first astronaut to space, put the first satellite out in space for Australia, it, uh, all of our nuclear munitions testing after World War II was on that. Um, so it became kind of a workhorse for different things after the end of World War II. <clears throat> a slide I should have had way earlier up in this lecture, what the difference is between air breathing and uh, rocket propulsion. In air breathing propulsion, well, propulsion in general, you have to combust your fuel to generate energy. And so um, if you use air, then you don't have to carry any oxygen. You just consume the air, inject some fuel into it, and then blow it up. That's air breathing propulsion. Rocket propulsion, on the other hand, uh, what if you need an engine that works out in space? A jet engine can't work in space. There is no air to consume. It's in a vacuum. So a rocket actually literally carries the oxidizer with itself out into space, or sometimes uh, still in um, the atmosphere. There are uses for rocket propulsion uh, within the atmosphere. But. 
yeah, that's the, the difference is whether or not you're carrying an oxidizer with you. Air breathing engines, not carrying any oxygen. Rockets, you're carrying oxygen. Uh, pictured on the top is a subsonic engine that is a turbofan or a turbojet, but pictured below that is a scramjet engine. So that is a hypersonic air breathing engine. Air breathing engines don't just uh, work at subsonic Mach numbers, they can work at a very wide range and widening range of Mach numbers. Uh, yeah. And I can show you clean little diagrams all day. Again, in reality, it's a whole nother ball game. On the, the right side, that is the space shuttle main engine or the RS-25. And that is a picture of every little feed line, every little valve. It gets insane. And full discrepancy, I do not know every line on that diagram. I don't. I don't. There's simpler diagrams than that that model more or less the space shuttle main engine. All of these engines do the same thing. Pressure increases, temperature increases. We do that however we'd like to. We could use a pump, we could use a compressor, or we could use, in the case of hypersonics, literally shock waves uh, to increase pressure and temperature. Now that we have our air and our fuel at a state where it's ready to blow up because it's at an increased pressure or temperature, we combust them. Then we get into the combustion sciences. And then at the end, uh, if I were to take a big step back to that delta V equation, the rocket equation, in the first equation I showed you in this class, we have to take that energy and turn it into work by expanding it and making it shoot out as fast as possible from the nozzle. We expel the products to turn power into useful work. Um, if yeah, the, no matter what engine we're looking at, this is the point. Even in electric engines where there's no combustion happening, uh, we're still trying to shoot stuff out as fast as possible in the opposite direction of the way we want to go. That's all an engine does. Is that readable? Yeah, that's readable out there. I commented on this earlier. You see down here, you see 6,000 Fahrenheit. That's the combustion chamber. And then leaving the pumps, you have negative 423 Fahrenheit. So this is like a power plant that's flying in the air. Um, the temperatures are all over the place, and that's why we have to talk about heat transfer and how we keep this thing from melting itself. Because whatever materials around the 6,000 Fahrenheit flame will melt itself if it's not actively cooled. Uh, we have to get into the technologies that we use to do that, to keep this thing intact. Oh yeah, uh, remember earlier I was talking about uh, models not being sufficient to show you how an engine's gonna behave and you have to just blow up engines until you figure it out. This is my probably, this is one of my favorite slides. Open loop mixture ratio control. So engineers, when they build the engine, they have, they have a computer that can control how much fuel and how much oxygen is going to different parts of the engine. And in open loop control, the engineers have hard coded what the valve positionings are going to be to control how much oxygen goes to the engine and how much fuel goes to the engine. Um, if you notice to the right of that line, it gets pretty stable, right? It's, it's practically flat lines. But to the left, all of these, this green dotted line that's up, down, all, all over the place, orange as well, these are the uh, pre-burner valves. They had to hard code these, I almost guarantee, after they just blew up Lord knows how many combustion chambers or failed to ignite the chamber. Um, and so this is just a testament to how much testing and work it takes to make an engine work. This isn't something we can just talk about in theory. You have to get up on a test stand and figure out how it's going to behave because all of these lines are hard coded. They didn't... No computer gave them these valve positions. They had to discover which ones would make it break and which ones would make it work through brute force. And so that, if that doesn't illustrate 
how much of an empirical science this is. And you have to just put the engine on a stand and measure how it's behaving. Uh, then I don't know how else to put it. Like that's the best example of how much of an applied science this is. We get into this when we get to solid rocket motors. Uh, how you expand flow to avoid shock waves and to avoid overexpansion or underexpansion, we'll get into that later this semester, but that is also tough. This is a, a, a turbo fan engine, it's called. We'll, we'll get into this at the end of January. And uh, these systems I have listed here, the three things they care about when, when designing uh, commercial turbofan engines. They care about noise reduction, as, as uh, surprising as that might be. Uh, the Concorde is a supersonic, I don't know if anybody's heard of that, but the Concorde was a supersonic uh, passenger aircraft that was no longer being fielded at all and became a failure for a variety of reasons, but one of the big ones is just it. Anybody within a two mile radius of the thing, whenever it took off, just had their ears shot. It was shattering windows in places, you know, in houses near the airport. So you could design a perfect system. If it's too loud, uh, well, you're back to square one. So uh, noise reduction, maximizing fan flow. Um, uh, we'll talk about that in a few lectures. I'm not going to talk about that now. Risk. In operating age and flight hours without incident, we are putting human beings up in these vehicles, right? These aren't astronauts. This is just me or you spending a couple hundred bucks to go somewhere. So uh, instead of caring about how amazing the performance of the engine is, although they do care about that, uh, priority one is are the human lives that are getting into this plane protected? And so how many thousands of hours has this engine gone without failure? And if for some reason an engine fails that is documented, that is distributed, everybody knows about it, it changes how many people invest in the engine. So if you are Rolls Royce and you are designing a turbofan engine, instead of worrying about, I mean, absolutely maximizing performance, you wanna design something, something that won't fail one out of 10,000 times, but will fail zero out of 10,000 times. So uh, when it comes to commercial engines like this, the, the one pictured here, Failure and risk is really, really important. Uh, uh, yeah, solid rocket motors, weight, storage, and predictability. And that gets into things we haven't studied yet, but weight is king in everything that we do. Uh, you could design a really high performance engine, but if the thing weighs a, a ton, then who cares how well it performs? You're having to accelerate that much more mass now with your rocket engine or with your vehicle. So uh, weight is always a consideration. It's very important when it comes to these solid rocket motors. Storability, uh, that, that is actually kind of an odd one to hear. So uh, I said this earlier, this, this solid propellant is fuel and oxidizer mixed. It's one homogeneous mixture of, of stuff. And if it's exposed to a flame at a high enough temperature, all of it blows up. There's no way to, well, there are actually techniques to, to shut it down, but, um, well, that's fair. Technologies do exist that can, it's, that it can extinguish a flame next to a solid rocket motor, but uh, whenever it's up in the air, it's gonna continue burning until it's out of fuel. So uh, if, the propellant combination you've chosen is something that will auto ignite at 100 degrees Fahrenheit. You can't, that's unacceptable. So uh, storability, how, how long it can sit in one spot without you having to remake the propellant or something like that um, is also important, especially when it comes to things like ICBMs. Uh, those things are gonna sit in the ground for decades what kind of propellant, what's the, prop what's the propellant gonna look like that you have a warhead on uh, that's been sitting there for 15 years? That's something you probably don't think about now, but when you're the engineer tasked with making sure that thing behaves the way you think it's gonna behave, it's very important. And finally, predictability. This is a Roman candle. You light it, 
it uh, gives you some thrust for a while and you control how much thrust it gives you per second based on how you design the motor and you want it to be precise. If it's giving more thrust than you want it to be giving at some given point in time, it could destroy a rocket. Um, so just making sure the thing is predictable. Liquid rocket engines, this is the Blue Origin BE-4. This is akin to a Russian engine actually. But liquid engines are a whole other ball game. Reliable ignition is difficult. And man, I'm, I almost don't want to touch this slide because it gets into stuff that's a bit too complicated. But I'll skip that point. Uh, we care about weight again. I mean, look, look at that picture. How much do you think that thing weighs? Again, if you have super high performance engines, but the engine weighs two tons, you're you're trading one flaw for another. You're getting high performance, but now you're having to accelerate more mass. And by Newton's third law, force equals mass times acceleration. You increase mass, uh, you can increase the force all you want, but if you increase mass, then acceleration isn't gonna change. So we need to control every gram that goes onto a rocket engine. And I mean every gram. <laughs> like they, they're that uh, precise about uh, weight. Now getting the hypersonics, uh, range is very important. Um, the reason hypersonics is being researched so aggressively is because if you take a solid rocket motor and you light it and you point it that way, it will go X distance. And you tell yourself, I need it to go for X distance. It's like, well, you'd better invent some technology that can do that doesn't exist yet. We're just going to run out of fuel and we can only go X distance. What hypersonics does is maximize the range of whatever you're trying to shoot down range uh, by utilizing air that's flying past uh, the engine. You could use air breathing techniques, um, minimizing drag through lifting body aerodynamics and all sorts of different things like that. But uh, maximizing range comes at a cost of maneuverability. A solid rocket motor, uh, like I told you earlier, it's a Roman candle. You light it, it just blows up, and it'll shoot. But with an air-breathing engine that's operating at Mach 5, if I take a left turn, all of the incoming air has completely different aerodynamics now. I have three-dimensional issues that I didn't even think about beforehand. And if you turn it fast enough, the, might, the whole engine might just stall. The air might stop coming into the engines. The shock waves won't generate the way that you expected them to. Things like that um, actually matter with hypersonics. This is something that might surprise you. Heat signature. Uh, that is a, that's a, a weapons tactic thing. If you have uh, air air missiles and you have interceptor missiles, the missiles will um, look for a signature to be able to tag the other missile and one of them is heat it will just literally look for heat in front of it and it will see this giant plume of smoke coming from the other missile and it will chase it so uh, the military will design hypersonic propellants that are low smoke or low heat signature to make them harder to target and then finally packaging uh, the saturn V rocket we don't care how big it is just get it to the moon why should we care we'll just build a bigger launch tower but with a missile like that, you can't just make it infinitely big. It has to fit in a compact box. And some limitation that the F-35 picture there, the F-22, will tell you. This is how big our packaging bay is. If the missile's bigger than this, it won't fit. That is your hard limit. So packaging is something else that matters. Uh, any questions? I've talked about so much stuff. I hope it's been, this is kind of just an overview of propulsion in general. Lecture one, we start getting into homework material and things like that in lecture two. But um, any questions just about propulsion in general? Cool, I'll just keep chugging along then. Uh, logistics, yeah, uh, that, <laughs> that system I actually had pictured a moment ago uh, that uses boron as its fuel, and that's an exotic fuel. That's not something that you typically use. 
with uh, engines. And so what if you just don't have boron? There are things like this that you have to consider. Um, the boosters that you build for the, the space shuttle, uh, we can't build those here at Edwards Air Force Base. We have to build them in Huntsville, Alabama. That's 2,000 miles away. You have to somehow get this giant thing from Huntsville, Alabama to Edwards Air Force Base. Uh, those are the kind of things that you might not even think about as being an issue that actually end up being a logistics issue and a cost issue. Um, yeah, money, money makes the world go round. If it costs a billion dollars to get it from Huntsville to Edwards, then they'll just not do it in Huntsville. Yes, our first and most important variable of this class, one of them, specific impulse uh, measured in seconds. This is a, a measurement of how efficient your engine is burning fuel. Uh, it is the thrust of your engine divided by the mass flow of fuel. If you have a low specific impulse, then to gain, to generate a Newton of thrust, you have to give it a lot of fuel. Or vice versa, if you have uh, a really high specific impulse, then to generate a Newton of thrust, you're barely having to give it any fuel. So this number is directly tied to efficiency. So that is, again, just looking at the, the variables on the far right, thrust in the numerator, m dot f as a derivative of mass fuel flow, or the mass fuel flow rate, and gravity is in the denominator to make the units work out. If you don't put gravity in the denominator, then the specific impulse comes out in meters per second. And that's just a, a propulsion thing. I don't really know anybody that expresses specific impulse in meters per second or feet per second, uh, they do it in seconds. And if you divide it by gravity, then it works out that way. Yeah, what did I just say? Okay, so I've talked about all these different engines. What do they look like on the efficiency scale? Um, anybody notice anything? Why are rockets so inefficient? Open question. Why do rockets suck? Use it once, zero. Hmm? You can use it once, unless it's SpaceX. Well, I guess to be specific, why does the specific, no, man, no pun intended. Why does the specific impulse of rockets suck? Yes, so it, um, regardless of where it is in space, whether it's in deep space or it's at sea level, it will use the same amount of oxidizer and fuel to burn. Uh, that doesn't, that's correct. It doesn't necessarily say why the specific impulse is so low though. And I will go back a slide and I'll give you a hint. Uh, what if that M dot F was just M dot propellant in general? Slowly going down as you're burning it off. Well, so a rocket carries oxidizer, right? So for air breathing engines, the mass flow of fuel is, they're only measuring fuel flow. They don't care about airflow because it didn't have to carry the air with it, right? It's just swallowing air as it flies. With a rocket, you have to count not only the fuel flow, but also the oxygen. And uh, at least for hydrogen engines, the oxidizer to fuel ratio, so how much oxygen you put in versus how much hydrogen you put in is six to one. So you're multiplying the amount of propellant that you're throwing into the engine by seven. Yeah. Um, and that is why the specific impulse is perfectly constant at all Mach numbers, but terrible. Uh, yeah. Let's see what else. No, that's it. That's uh, an important one. This, this map puts little distinctions between where the turbofan starts and where the turbofan stops, and then a turbofan with an afterburner starts and stops. What we'll discover through this class and looking at different systems is there's actually significant overlap. 
there isn't a clear like, oh, we're at Mach 2, I can no longer use a turbo fan. That's not necessarily true. Uh, there's different technologies and, and techniques and procedures you can use to expand the operating window of an engine, uh, things like that. So there's all sorts of overlap here. You know. Propellant mass fraction, yeah. And this is why we use solid rocket motors and why we stage rockets. Um, Any time that you are accelerating inert mass, so I have my engine running on my rocket and it produces one mega newton force. Uh, by Newton's third law, force equals mass times acceleration. If I can reduce mass, what happens to this equation? Force is stuck in stone by the engine. If I reduce mass, acceleration has to go up. I want to impart delta V or acceleration to my payload. That's my entire goal. That's why I have this engine is to accelerate the thing. So that is why you'll watch uh, the Falcon 9, or you'll watch the Space Shuttle, or you'll watch the Saturn V, all those things, and they're shooting away and they're discarding parts of the rocket as it goes. They're just getting rid of mass that they don't need anymore. And uh, by maximizing the propellant mass fraction, what you're doing is you're minimizing the weight that you don't need. That's a, that's a, that's a layman's terms way of putting it, but you're getting rid of all the things that don't directly contribute to your payload, the thing you care about getting into orbit or going down there, down range, um, getting the energy from the engine. So um, that's why we stage rockets. And that's why we want high propellant mass fraction. Um, yeah. This is a, another efficiency term that we use for air breathing engines. And this is how much thrust we get per unit kilogram or per unit uh, mass flow of air. So um, this is again only used for air breathing engines. Thrust specific fuel consumption I believe is the exact opposite. It's just another way of putting it. Uh, yeah, you have m dot f divided by f. It's, it, it's basically the same thing. And, uh, and, I, and, and you might be thinking, why doesn't he just show me one or the other? And the reason I show you both is because that'll just show up in literature as you study. They'll talk about thrust-specific fuel consumption and specific thrust. Both get cited and used. So. Characteristic velocity. Uh, you don't have to write this equation down. Don't worry about uh, writing every bit down. I say that, uh, it is kind of important. I just write it down. Just write it down. <laughs> I'm sorry. The switcheroo. This is a number shown that shows combustion performance. If you look at the middle equation there, it is the chamber pressure times the throat area divided by m dot. Yeah, and so with a rocket engine, you have to produce certain conditions to make it work at the throat. At the throat of the engine, if it doesn't meet these specific temperature and pressure requirements, whenever you try to expand the flow, it might just not expand, it might fail. And so this equation here demonstrates uh, how efficiently and at what uh, kind of conditions we're able to get the rocket engine to begin operation. So high throat areas equals really high mass flow. Um, but if you can get a high throat area with a low mass flow, that means that you are able to operate this engine without so much propellant entering your combustion chamber. And then this is a little side comment. Every time you have high chamber pressure, you have high efficiency. Low pressure, low efficiency, high pressure, high efficiency. But things start to blow up at high pressures. So that's when it becomes an engineering thing. It's like, okay, well, how high can we push the pressure before we just start blowing stuff up? Uh, this is expansion performance. So this is everything 
the the C star equation I had the combustion performance that was everything up to the throat of the engine and this is everything downstream from the throat of the engine so the the nozzle and this is measuring how efficiently we're expanding our flow and if you look at uh, the combustion performance times the expansion performance you just end up with specific impulse it all works out really clean so c star times your uh, thrust coefficient just equals specific impulse and yeah you have to sneak in gravity otherwise it's meters per second and I hate meters per second for a specific impulse. I touched on this a little bit earlier. Um, weight is very important. And I have pictured here two different um, commercial turbofans that are used for passenger airlines and the Rolls-Royce engine is outperforming the General Electric engine in every way uh, it has a lower thrust specific fuel consumption that means it requires less fuel per Newton of force to work uh, it operates at a higher pressure ratio and it has a higher bypass ratio which means nothing to you now but that just means it's more efficient it works with uh, a smaller core uh, the thing is, it just works out that it's heavy. And so now we have to do more analysis to see whether or not these increases in performance are really warranted because now we have to deal with all this extra inert mass that came from the engines. Um, so thrust to weight is not necessarily um, the be all end all. There is no, no one number you can look at to see how good an engine is in any space, whether it's hypersonics, commercial turbofans, solid rocket motors, you can't just look at one number and say this thing is amazing or bad. Um, you kind of have to take a look at a, a system holistically and, and look at all of the different parameters about how it's designed and how it behaves to understand whether or not it's good. Um, is that showing up there? Yeah, sweet. Let me see if I can press play on this. So on this, we have four different rockets. We have the Saturn V on the left. We have the Space Shuttle, the Falcon Heavy, and the Space Launch System. And the yellow, the blue is oxidizer. These are rocket engines that this has to work. It's a rocket. The blue is oxidizer. The yellow is hydrogen, and the red is kerosene. And uh, what you'll notice whenever I press play on this is that the hydrogen disappears really fast compared, the yellow stuff goes away much faster than the red stuff or the kerosene. And so hydrogen produces way higher specific impulses than kerosene. Uh, the specific impulse of the second stage engine for, uh, I think, the Saturn V was over 400 seconds, and the engine that they use on the first stage of Falcon 9 is under 300. So we're talking over a 33% increase in performance, something ludicrous like that. Um, but as you watch this video, you'll notice that that hydrogen comes with a price because all of the inert weight and just storing this super not dense uh, element, hydrogen, as is the least dense element in the universe, um, it comes at a cost. And so I'll just press play and let you watch that. So uh, that's also something worth noting. On the far left, the Saturn V, you'll notice the first stage, this giant first stage, it does a ton of thrust. 
is almost just as big as the second stage because the second stage has to use hydrogen. And so I keep talking about it. Weight matters more than anything else. And if you have all of this inert weight going towards holding hydrogen, then that increase in performance from using hydrogen might not be worth it. Um, what else? Oh, you look at the Falcon Heavy. I mean, that kerosene is still, is still chilling there. It's at like 75% capacity still. Um, and you'll just start to notice um, some oddities about how kerosene behaves differently than hydrogen as you watch these rockets go up. If you have any questions, just... You said kerosene's red? Yeah. Kerosene's red, hydrogen is yellow, and then the solid rocket motors are something else. They're, they look like, I don't know, cigarette smoke. <laughs> um, Fun fact, the space shuttle, uh, those two solid rocket motors, they're really inefficient, but they provide almost 90% of the thrust to get it off the pad, 90%. So we'll look later this semester at solid rocket motors, and the specific impulse will be terrible. You'll be like, why do we use these? And it's because there's, they behave in a predictable way, and they produce a lot of thrust. They're, they're thrust energy dense so if you have a limited amount of space to use to um, build your rocket then solid rocket motors have the most energy density and yeah so you watch the first stage there for the space shuttle and sls on the right where the solid rocket motors got shot off. That's, again, to get rid of all of the weight that you don't need anymore. If it's empty, it gets shot away. And you constantly are staging your rockets to minimize inert weight so that you can increase your acceleration. And, uh, yeah. So there's a watch the whole thing. Oh, yeah, we do not have to watch the whole thing. <laughs> Just sit here like for nine minutes. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, that's it. So we went over the syllabus and kind of expectations for the semester. Um, I hope I've given you a good overview of what we care about in propulsion. Um, I know this is a bit unstructured. I, I told you earlier I'm just pressing a lot of material into one semester, and I just tried to give you an overview of all of that material in one day. So, yeah, this I'm, if this if this lecture seemed like too much all at once, it, it was too much all at once. Um, it's going to start getting down to bite-sized chunks and something that's more digestible starting next week. Um, yeah, any questions at all about? Any of these slides that totally weren't numbered so you can't go at back and ask me about. <laughs>